Welcome to Failed Utopia, the podcast about utopian ideas and paradise lost. We look at utopian concepts of the past, present, and future, as well as utopian societies and communes, which promise the world to eager followers, but inevitably fail when it all starts to unravel. Failed Utopians, it's Anna, your slightly gullible podcast host. What do you think of when you hear free love commune? If you're an American like me, I'm guessing you're thinking 1960s or 70s alternative communities and hippies, not devout Christians in the 1800s. Today, we're talking about the Oneida community, the only cult that turned itself into a silverware company. Some episodes of this podcast contain disturbing or upsetting topics. Use your discretion for yourself and those around you. This won't be appropriate for kids. If you feel you need support, please find help through a crisis line, mental health professional, or a friend or family member. I have resources including crisis hotline phone numbers listed in the show notes. Twenty-year-old John Humphrey Noyes got religion at a tent revival in 1831, thanks to revivalist superstar Charles Finney. This period of time marked the Second Great Awakening, and it saw a surge in popularity of the type of religious meeting which involved fiery theatrical sermons and rapturous congregants convulsing, weeping, crying out, and collapsing in the aisles. People were looking for an alternative to puritanical and stuffy churches that typically dominated the American religious landscape during Calvinism's reign. It also marked a shift from relying solely on a religious leader to transmit the Word of God toward a philosophy of direct, personal connection and communication with God. Born in Vermont to a congressman father and devoutly religious mother, Noyes seemed on track to study law, but after his transformation at the tent revival, he was determined to become a preacher instead. So he went on to attend Andover Theological Seminary and Yale Divinity School. But he developed some ideas that just didn't comport with the religious thinking of the time, and Yale sent him packing. Those ideas were what he would eventually develop into the philosophy of the Oneida community. One of the beliefs that got him kicked out of Yale but would become a key tenet of the Oneida community was perfectionism. While other revivalists of the time preached a second coming of Christ sometime in the future, Noyes claimed that Christ had already returned. Thus, paradise on earth was possible now, and his followers could achieve perfect freedom from sin while still on earth in the millennial kingdom. Of course, he believed that he'd achieved this sin-free perfection himself and could show others the path back to Eden. He started preaching around the Northeast and found it hard to gain traction at first, traveling the region with his strange religious ideas and no income to support himself. One of the first people to admire the messages of this filthy, raving hobo was Abigail Merwin. Noise grew to admire and even fall in love with Merwin, but As fate would have it, she married someone else while remaining a follower of Noyes. Noyes didn't take this turn of events particularly well, and in 1837 he came up with the idea of spiritual spouses, which became spiritual polyamory and complex marriage, another one of the bedrocks of his new utopia. Noyes found traditional marriage between one man and one woman to be 
a selfish arrangement that promoted possessive love and deprived participants of a greater love encompassing all men and all women. It should be noted that Noy's vision only included heterosexual polyamory. He felt that exclusiveness breeds jealousy and strife. He did go on to marry a woman named Harriet Holton, but it was what we'd call today an open marriage. Holton came with an extra perk, money in the form of a large inheritance, enough to get a small commune off the ground. The couple and a few disciples started a small community in Putney, Vermont. They survived by farming and logging, and slowly but surely, new converts were added to the flock. By the 1840s, what Noyce was then calling the Society of Inquiry had grown to a few dozen followers. Noyce had continued preaching perfectionism, and also continued his crusade against traditional marriage. In 1846, he arranged for ten people, including himself and two of his sisters, to enter into a group marriage contract. All ten people were to be considered married to each other. This contract also officially made Noyes the spiritual leader of the group. The commune's unconventional ways drew anger from the outside, and Noyes was arrested on adultery charges. Facing growing hostility, the group moved to a farm near Oneida Creek in New York and changed the name of their society to the Oneida Community. Another core practice at the Oneida Community was a form of mutual criticism administered through meetings at which an individual group member would be called out and critiqued by the rest of the group. The object was to eliminate faults, weaknesses, and undesirable characteristics and traits in oneself. It actually reminds me a lot of the Synanon game. That's in episode one, if you haven't listened yet. According to a 1937 book by one of Noyes' sons, participants came to believe their mutual criticism practice could cure ills of the body as well as the soul. He also stated that, quote, the human temptation to vent personal dislikes on a victim was not resisted by everyone, unquote, but that members approved of and felt they benefited from the experience. New converts arriving lived together, and they were told to divide their attention and love equally among the other members. Many new members came to the community as married couples who already had children. It wasn't allowed to show more care for one's own children or spouse than any other child or community member. This may sound crazy and just counterintuitive, but there are actually some reasonable or at least interesting concepts behind that idea. If that piques your interest, check the show notes for a link to an episode of the Hidden Brain podcast about just that. At Oneida, adults lived together in a sort of dormitory format, while the kids lived in a children's house, with rotating adults acting as teachers and caring for them, rather than their own biological parents. The reason I'm going to go ahead and call the Oneida community a cult, as opposed to just an alternative community or a bunch of weirdos, is because while it lacked some of the other hallmarks of a cult, it did engage in abusive practices toward its underage members, who didn't have a choice in the matter. While there didn't seem to be the level of brainwashing or coercive control that we most associate with full-blown cults, they did have victims. Okay, I know there was a content warning up front, but just so you know, this is where it gets a little uncomfortable. If you don't want to hear this part, please skip ahead about a minute. You'll still be able to follow along with the rest of the story. Don't worry. In 
It seems that Noyes and his followers didn't have much of a plan for what to do with the community's kids when they grew up. If this social experiment was to last multiple generations, they needed a way to integrate the grown children of the community as adult members. So Noyes came up with a new plan. When the kids reached puberty, males would be matched to postmenopausal women as sexual partners, partially to avoid unintended pregnancies. And of course, the girls would be matched up with older men. They called these encounters interviews, and it was more or less the way they indoctrinated the kids into the community lifestyle. Today, we'd call these interviews statutory rape. Later, the young people could request interviews with other young people, but those requests had to be approved. Birth control was a huge deal because Noyes thought pregnancy was very harmful to women's physical health, spiritual health, and human potential. He was very affected by having seen his wife having four stillborn babies over the course of six years. He also didn't want a bunch of kids running around, problematic in terms of the community's limited financial resources. It just couldn't sustain a population boom. Instead of simply using the time-honored withdrawal method of contraception, Noyes took it a step further and preached his own method that he called male continence, in which the males would never ejaculate. Hmm. This doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but it must have worked pretty well, because in a community of two or three hundred people, only 30 or 40 kids were born in the two decades between 1848 and 1868. If a couple did wish to procreate, they had to apply to a committee. Those applications were usually, but not always, approved. The Oneida community actually started to gain some interest from the outside for its effective birth control, and after receiving many letters asking for the secret, Noise produced and distributed a pamphlet with all the details. The common refrain that Oneida was a free love commune before its time falls apart when we dig beneath the surface. In reality, relationships may have been unconventional, but they were tightly controlled. Freed up from the strain of constant pregnancies and childcare, females did enjoy better health outcomes and a more egalitarian position in this community than in larger society at that time. They had short hair and wore bloomers, which are kind of like pants and super attractive. They participated alongside men in manual labor and playing sports, and men performed household duties, very radical and unheard of at that time. In 1862, the community completed construction on a 93,000-square-foot mansion, and new additions were later added to accommodate its 300 or so members. The design for the mansion was arranged around communal living, and a new south wing would later house the children. With hundreds of new members now living at the Oneida community, they needed more money. While their little slice of paradise was partially based on socialist utopian ideas, they turned to capitalism to accumulate wealth. They grew fruit and made thread and leather bags to sell on the open market. Trapping was a booming industry in the mid-19th century, and they sold metal bear and fox traps. Along with the community's growing prosperity came changes. Now that they could support a larger population, Noyes stopped preaching his birth control gospel and developed a new interest in eugenics. In the decade between 1870 and 1880, about 60 kids were born in a program Noise called Stirpa Culture. 
Apparently, the name was inspired by the Latin word stirps, which has some reference to stems or roots. Parents of the children were chosen and matched by committee. When the babies were weaned, usually after a year or so, they were placed in the children's home. Parents could visit their kids, but people running the children's department at Oneida had complete jurisdiction over how the kids were raised. If any parents were seemingly becoming too attached to their own children above their attachment to anyone else in the commune, a period of separation would be enforced. The kids followed strict schedules of prayer, school, work, and play. As it turned out, the children they were designing for physical and spiritual perfection were no different than any other children. Noyes may have had another motivation for his breeding program. By mixing and matching the parents of these children, it gave him an opportunity to break up pairs of adults who seemed to have more of an attachment to one another than their social rules encouraged. He didn't want couples pairing off, disrupting their group arrangements. The community itself largely thrived through this time. They'd done very well financially with the animal traps, and in 1877, they added to their business operations by starting a silverware factory. However, only about a year after they got the factory up and running, the commune collapsed. New marriage laws had been enacted, and the group faced more intense external pressure regarding their complex marriage practices and accusations of statutory rape. Between external hostility toward the commune, internal squabbles and rebellions, and a failed attempt at handing off leadership to his eldest son, Noyes fled to Canada in 1879, abandoning his utopian dream and the family he'd built. Other community members remained behind at Oneida, but they largely drifted away from their complex marriages and toward monogamous marriages once Noyes was out of the picture. Secretly, it turned out, many of them already had a favorite. As the children of the Sterpiculture experiment came of age, it turned out they were less religious and more educated than the previous generation, and they too preferred more traditional relationships, marriages, and child-rearing practices. Descendants of the Oneida community have sometimes seemed to gloss over some of the more radical aspects of the group's history, and sometime after World War II, some of them actually burn almost all of the community's documents. The Oneida community was officially dissolved in 1880, but took on the corporate form of Oneida Limited and kept producing flatware. Oneida became the largest seller of silverware in America by the mid-20th century. Oneida was particularly popular throughout the century among young brides and newlyweds setting up traditional households. It's the kind of stuff an engaged couple might put on their wedding registry at Macy's. The Oneida Mansion House is still standing today. It's a National Historic Landmark and Museum, and in fact, the house is inhabited by some of Noy's descendants. The property includes a hotel and an apartment complex, and ironically, even a wedding venue. How charming. Next Thanksgiving, if you notice Aunt Marge has Oneida silverware on the table, that's a great time to bring up communistic, child-abusing sex cults. Hey, it's better than talking politics. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts to help other people find it. Tell your friends about it, and if you want to support the pod directly and help keep new episodes coming, you can donate to the show through the link in the show notes. 
Connect and stay in the loop on the website, failedutopia.com, or the Facebook page at Failed Utopia Pod. Failed Utopia episodes are written and produced by me, Anna Roberts. The burning palm tree painting featured on the cover is by artist Perry Vasquez. My intro music is by Elliot Middleton. See you next time.